the questions that often comes in, in your books, the Lord has blessed you with the ability to recall uh, minute details of mm -hmm. things that happened in your past life. Some folks have wondered, do you have a photographic memory? How is it that you're able to remember all of these details and conversations from so long ago? Well, it's because of the, the power of prayer. I do very little without asking for a, a blessing upon my mind and upon my life. And uh, if I try to remember things that have taken place 51 years ago, for instance, I ask for the Lord to, to, to by the power of His Holy Spirit, uh, to uh, bring back to my remembrance things as if they had taken place yesterday. Now we have a Bible promise where Jesus said the Holy Spirit will bring mm -hmm. to your remembrance yep. when we ask Him to. Right. So I, I've been practicing this, this type of faith, this, this belief, and it has worked well for me. In your book, Incredible Answers to Prayer, and more incredible answers to prayer and the incredible power of prayer, which incidentally is a miracle in itself. I understand they're breaking records. That's the book of sharing for the church for 1998. The incredible power of prayer. Of course, you have the book on the supernatural and angels, which is a very, uh, very uh, powerful subject. Mm -hmm. But I think it tells us that the people in the church are hungry for a revival in their prayer life. A lot of people feel empty. They feel like their prayers are ineffective. Mm -hmm. And that leads me to my next question. How can our prayers be answered? Many are wondering, like yours, how can we experience these kind of dramatic answers? Well, uh, I believe that, first of all, you have to have a solid relationship with Christ. Amen. Okay? And then I believe solemnly that our hearts need to be attuned with the heart of God, our Heavenly Father, in a special way. And this attuning of the heart of the heart of God can be done only through the Holy Spirit. You see? Now, every day, uh, here's what I do. When I, when I wake up in the morning, my first five or ten minutes is to thank the Lord for being alive, uh, to thank the Lord for the glorious day that's going to be before me with, because of His blessings and His grace and His love. And also, for the experience that will be mine to be able to bless the life of others that I want him to, to accomplish in my life. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, then, uh, one thing that I've got to do, and I feel it's most important, is to ask the Lord Jesus uh, to, um, to bless my mind and to clothe me with, with the robe of his righteousness. See? Our righteousness, the Bible says, is like filthy rags. So, uh, I asked my problem solver if he would this day clothe me with the robe of his righteousness. First of all, I want to say, I say, Lord, if I have offended you in thoughts, words, or deeds since I last conversed with you in prayer, please forgive me. Now, that's a very important point. Oh, you begin all your prayers by cleaning oh, the yes. slate oh, yeah. before the Lord. No. I consider it a waste of time. Now, this is just my opinion, and, uh, and uh, I don't have this, the wisdom of Solomon, okay? But in 51 years of, of living for God, I have found that you want to make sure that when you go before your problem solver, Christ Jesus, or before our Heavenly Father, the great monarch of the galaxies, you want to make sure that there's no cobweb on your face. You know? <laughs> so before I, middle of the day I'm work, uh, working, and I, I talk to my Heavenly Father, the day, I, I should say that the first half of the day is, is pretty well 100% dedicated to my con conversing with Jesus in prayer because of his being my, our problem, problem solver. That's what our Heavenly Father sent him to do. Mm -hmm. okay? And then the rest of the day and all that, I spend my time thanking God for all the blessings received that have come into my life and also in the lives of all of my prayer subjects. We get dozens of letters uh, and, and the people tell us how the Spirit of God is blessing their lives in marvelous, miraculous ways. All they did is read maybe one or two of these books and they got some good ideas. And they're trying to, to, to figure out, uh, to see if they work, and they do. Now, to attune the heart with God, first of all, uh, after I, I uh, well, let, let, let me continue what I said. I asked the Lord Jesus to please clothe me with a robe of his righteousness, that as I go before our Heavenly Father this day, in giving of thanks, and also, in seeking additional grace and strength for myself and for all of my prayer subjects, that our Heavenly Father will see me 
not as I am, but it will see me through the glory of Christ's righteousness. See, that's mm -hmm. what I want to have done. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. Then one more little favor, Lord Jesus. Would you today make my prayers uh, of great interest our Heavenly Father? by causing them to carry imprints of Calvary. Mm -hmm. Mainly reminiscent of the great agony that you suffered in Gethsemane. When the future of humanity hung in the balance. And the biblical record says, and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. Mm -hmm. and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground that's right so I pray that uh, my prayers will be of special interest to our Heavenly Father you know I found that uh, in my experience one of the most important qualifiers in effective prayer and not only cleaning your slate before the Lord but a sincerity and earnestness Something else I've discovered, our prayers become routine when we're only praying for ourselves because yeah. we keep asking for the same things. Yeah. When we're praying for others, the needs are always different and so our prayers are freshened and we're directed away from self and we become like Christ who is constantly interceding yeah. for others. Yeah. Uh, another question I know that many people uh, are always wondering about how or do you know some, some uh, special clues where people can have victory over sin? How do we become overcomers in connection with prayer, perhaps? Well, uh, you have to, uh, to receive very special help from the Holy Spirit. And uh, I like the, the Apostle Paul, the way he prayed for the Ephesians. He prayed for the Ephesians, you know, the, in, in Ephesians, the third chapter, and he said, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now what the Apostle was saying is this, he was seeking the means, the only means by which people can be living victorious, successful Christian life, and it's by the Holy Spirit imparting to us the nine elements that make up the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. For instance, the first three elements of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is this. We all need mm -hmm. precious measures of heavenly love, heavenly joy, and heavenly peace. Now, the next three uh, elements of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. And Ellen White says that if we sought these special graces in our lives for ourselves and for the people that we pray for, a great transformation should take place. Because, you see, uh, Jesus lived a perfect life. And it was done by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in uh, Christ Object Lessons, page uh, 139, we are told about Jesus. Not for himself, but for others, he thought and lived and prayed. Mm -hmm. Daily, he received the fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, in studying the fruit of the Holy Spirit, uh, I mean the elements that make up the fruit of the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, we find long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness were elements of the character of Christ on earth that made him who he was. So gloriously, preciously, mercifully, compassionately, uh, interested in the uh, well-being of others and his father honored him because he did this you know you you brought something to my attention mm -hmm. in the fruits of the spirit and when it comes to overcoming you can't have the goodness unless you first have the love That's and right. love is the motivating power and mm -hmm. so when the Holy Spirit gives us that love we don't want to wound Jesus that's right you know on in desire page 330 there's a beautiful passage that it says about Christ um, so he goes again. He tells it about the fact that uh, love for God, zeal for his glory, and love for fallen humanity brought Jesus to earth to suffer and to die. This was the controlling power in his life. Mm 
-hmm. And this principle, he bids us adopt. See? In the battle between good and evil angels, in, in two of your books, uh, Trip into the Supernatural and Beware of Angels, uh, we can see that uh, evil angels often masquerade as good angels. Um, right. Paul tells us Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Mm -hmm. How can we be safe in determining the, or distinguishing the difference? The difference. Well, I tell you what. Any time that people talk to you and you can detect the fact that they have left people, you've left people, angels or strong feelings, uh, they have been led away from it, thus say it the Lord, regardless how little it does say it of, of the Lord may be. When it's not in perfect harmony with the Bible, there is danger there. Mm -hmm. And these people, like these, uh, uh, this group of 19 people up in uh, Oregon, between 1983 to 88, that is right, uh, they had prayed to see angels, he felt, like many of the uh, evangelical uh, churches in this country, that the time had arrived to petition God and, hey, let's ask him to do something for us. To send his angels to come and talk with us like the people did in the Bible times, you see. And the angel that came and says, we come from the throne of God. Beautiful, glorious angels. And they, David... Uh, <clears throat> um, well, there was, there was a guy in there and, and his wife, they entertained in their homes over a hundred angels, I think it was 161 angels in four and a half years. Appeared to them. Appeared to them, entertained them in their home, talked with them, angels came back. But these weren't and good angels. Them. That's right. But you see, when these, what these people did, the angels gave them signs that they were not the angels of God, not wanting to. But here's something. One lady, <clears throat> they were a group there, about 15 people, and this person by the name of Lynn uh, was talking about an angel that had appeared to her, and she asked different questions to the angel uh, that the people wanted to have answers to. Mm -hmm. And one question this lady said, uh, ask uh, the uh, messenger angel, uh, how would I have to go about, uh, what I would I have to do to talk to my uh, 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 you know, uh, companion angel, or uh, <clears throat> guardian angel. Guardian angel. And the angel said, I can't help you with that. Because we, messenger angels, are of a higher... Uh, higher sphere. Sphere of, of you know, uh, than the uh, uh, guardian, guardian angels. angels. And we never talk to one another. Can you imagine that? They don't have good relationships, I guess. They don't have good relationships at all. Now, these people should have said, wait a minute. That should have been I a red cannot flag. Believe, huh? yeah. That's right. I cannot believe that, that these angels, you know, that uh, uh, glorify God, uh, behave toward one another like that. So that was one of the little errors that saved the Lord, and he brought a number of others, and I wish I would have had more time in the... The well, one of, the, let me have more. one of the common errors that I, th I think you allude to is they start out acting like they believe the Bible, but little by little they start saying, well, that's not completely accurate, that doesn't mean what it says, and they start to discard and pull away from the scriptures. That's right. Then, one day, an angel appeared to them and said, look, I have some revelations that our Heavenly Father wants me to pass on to you. That the Seventh-day Adventist Church is all wrong in regards to the state of the dead. We do, humans do have an immortal soul, you see? And they do travel through space, and I will prove it to you. The angel said to Lynn, your husband from now on will be given the power of spiritual travel. Or, you know, the... Uh, to channel himself channel in space himself. travel, yeah. And, sure enough, it says that uh, he started to, before he, he, he would be taken on a, on a spiritual trip, so to speak, he would start speaking in tongues. He would sit himself on the floor in the living room, start talking in tongues. And all of a sudden, he fell asleep, 
And then uh, he would come back and wake up and uh, his wife said, uh, what, where have you been and what did you see? And the things that he told, you know, the holy city, he went to this planet that was given to him, that was his planet for him to have, to rule over, and the inhabitants there were uh, uh, very, very uh, Short. little. They were shorter than... Uh, Lilliputians. Uh, is it a bonsai tree? <laughs> <laughs> you know the little... Uh, uh, Munchkins? Uh, yeah. You know the uh, bonsai Cabbage tree. Cabbage patch dolls? Yeah. So the long story short, you know, he, he was all thrilled. He's going to be this great ruler of this planet, you know, that... Uh, so the devil can give you dreams and give you visions. Yeah. Man, I'm telling you. Oh, yeah. You know, one thing that I, I don't want to rush past before we leave this subject... Uh, it's maybe not safe for Christians to constantly look for signs and wonders and angels. This That's is what right. Jesus was addressing in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, where he said, if you do not believe Moses and the prophets, meaning the law and the prophets, the yep. word of God, yep. then you'll not be persuaded that one should rise from the dead. Yep. So Christ is telling us, don't put your stock in signs and wonders. It's not safe. That's right. The devil can give you signs and wonders. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. You're very, very capable. You know, another question that came in, and I, I'd like to get some help on this one. Sometimes when we pray, and I want to know if I'm alone, my mind wanders. Mm -hmm. And I might have the time reserved, and I'm undistracted from outside, but I get distracted on the inside. And while I'm kneeling there praying, my mind starts thinking about all the little things I need to do during the day, and I think, I'm, I'm not praying now. Mm -hmm. What can you do? Am I the only one that struggles with this? Let's take a vote. Uh, what can we do to stay more focused when we pray? Well, I've had the same problem, you know. And, uh, oh, I feel better now. <laughs> okay. I've had the same problem for a long time, but uh, immediately when my mind starts to wonder, uh, I ask the Lord to please have your Holy Spirit entertain my mind with those things that you would like me to think about, those things that will uh, wrap me up in, 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 into... Uh, having a greater and better vision of good things to come and of living uh, a better life for Christ, uh, you know, while we're, uh, while we're around. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found it's the only way to break the, the tendency to, to the mind running on everything under the sun, you know. You know, one thing I've, I, I don't want to jump in your shoes here, but mm -hmm. uh, one thing the Lord has shown me that's been of some help when we understand the reverent, powerful nature of God, you know, we begin the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name. Yeah. That, I think, is the key to keep your mind from wandering. Because when you're talking to somebody who's a friend and you're just riding in the car together, you, you sometimes, if it's a casual acquaintance, they don't have your full attention. If you're talking to a reigning monarch and they're addressing you, you are focused. Oh, yes. And, you know, when we realize the greatness of God, when we come before him, mm -hmm. it's easier to stay focused on what we're doing while we're on our knees in the morning yeah. and, and to stay tuned into heaven. Yeah. Um, how, what can we do? How can we be changed so we'll want to love God more? Uh, I think some will admit that we, we want to pray more, but we don't have the desire. We want to love God more. Mm -hmm. What can we do? What practical things can we do so we'll love God more and want to talk to him more? Yeah. Well, I come back to Calvary. Because... As you explain to the Father that his having permitted the Lord of glory to come to this land of the enemy, mm -hmm. to have allowed him to go to the way of Calvary and purchase our redemption at such a great cost, uh, you want to get a little help. You want to get a little help because you appreciate what he has done in allowing this today to, to take place, his only begotten son, giving him to be a ransom for a uh, you know, uh, uh, earth full of, of rebel, uh, rebels. And uh, you have to say to the Lord, I need your help. Please do what needs to be done in my life to enable me to find pleasure in those things that I have never been, and never created a habit of doing. A change of heart. Change of heart, yeah. Transformation. Right. A number of people are concerned that when they sin, now this person is asking about losing their temper in particular, I don't know where they got that idea. <laughs> but uh, that was our message this morning here at Central. Right. But if a person sins, uh, some folks get discouraged and they think, I've gone too far. Uh, can you belong to Jesus 100% and still make mistakes like that? Yes. We are inclined to make mistakes. <laughs> That's our nature to make mistakes, you know, because we're, we're not perfect. 
and uh, to live the uh, life, the ideal, exemplary life, for instance, uh, in this day and age, uh, is not easy. And you need to be uh, helped, like I said earlier. We need a, a miracle every day to walk yeah. with him one moment at a time. Yeah. You know, there's one little uh, story that we've missed, and this is not a question, a personal question, but it's something I wanted to be able to include. Can you finish the miracle about the copier? Oh, yes. Some people are, yes. know what Thank I'm you. talking about and some don't, but uh, it's in the book. In any it's event. in the book. It's in um, the book that came out in 1995, When You Need Incredible Answers to Prayer. First, uh, let me tell you what happened. In 1991, in the fall of the year, Hilda and I were invited by our daughter and son-in-law, Michael and Linda Atley, to come and spend the holidays with them, you know, uh, from Thanksgiving on to uh, uh, New Year's. And, and I knew that he had in mind of convincing this old guy here that he needed to move to California. <laughs> but he loved to have us with them, so we decided to come uh, to California. And uh, I brought, of course, my uh, electronic typewriter that I had at the time, and uh, my copier and a couple of other things that I needed to keep working on a book. And one uh, evening, uh, our grandson, whom we refer to as Little Michael, he's 26 years old now, <laughs> six foot one or two, Little Michael came and says, Grandpa, yeah, your copier ran out of toner. Because I had been expecting the thing to run out of any, almost any time because, you know, it goes green, then it goes yellow, the indicator, it goes red. then it goes red, and then it, got, it was real bright red. And I said, oh, this good. thing is going to go uh, bad on you almost any time. And I called some of the uh, office supply places and they told me to put a, uh, replace the cartridge. It cost $79. That was the best deal I got. And I said, yeah, you know, I realized that I, realized that I won't be able to buy a, a cartridge for this thing for about a month until my other sources here, they came in, you know. Check comes in. Then I got thinking. I saw the Israelites uh, on the battlefield. And uh, I saw also the experience of Joshua and uh, when he, he prayed that the sun, sun would st stand, stand still. Mm -hmm. And a number of other beautiful experiences of the God's Holy Word passed before my, my mind in quick succession. And then I, I talked to the Lord. I said, Lord, uh, you know that uh, I have a cartridge there that ran dry, no more toner. I don't have the money to buy a cartridge for at least another three weeks. And uh, because you are the great God, God that you are, and because of the fact that you've done so many marvelous things in, in ages past, I would love to, to, to see you do something exciting for this uh, old guy. Would you please commission your Holy Spirit to create toner in that cartridge so that I can have copies. Because see, all the letters I write to people, I keep copies, copies of everything. And I said, it would be such a blessing. And beside that, Lord, if you didn't have the means to be a difference, but you are super wealthy in capacity. That's right. You know, not only dollars, Small but in capacity to, the Lord. to create. That's right. And I said, your Holy Spirit, you know, that controlled the, the waters of creation, you know, divided the waters, etc., etc. Uh, these things have passed in my mind, see? I said, he's well able to cause uh, toner to be created into that cartridge. I, and as a matter of fact, I started to thank the Lord for it. I started to thank him. I said, Lord, I'm so delighted in, in my mind because yeah, I can't see you, you're doing this thing for me. No question about it, you see? Because the Lord, the experience coming in your life, that after a while, the Holy Spirit makes you feel that it's a done thing, mm -hmm. okay? And I said, Lord, it's so marvelous, so marvelous, so wonderful. I, I, so I praised him for all the other things he'd done for me over the, over the decades. So. so I fell asleep, got up in the morning, Hilda and I were having breakfast. And I said to Hilda, honey, we're going to have, we're going to see a miracle this morning. A miracle of the Spirit of God. Uh, you will? I said, yes. Uh, I talked to the Lord about my cartridge and, and toner that ran dry. And the Holy Spirit is going to create toner in there. I don't know what he's going to fill the cartridge up or what he's going to make it as people as I multiply need. Multiply the toner. Multiply the toner. Yeah. So she said, and I said, after breakfast, we're going to go in and, and check it out. Well, she said, don't wait until after breakfast. Let's go now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we move over to the dining room where there was a, a, another dining room table. There was another little table I had the copier on. I picked up a letter I had and put it under the cover and... 
Uh, and I just pushed a, a beautiful white sheet of paper into the inlet, and what do you think came out on the other end? A perfect copy. And I said, Hilda, well, you'd like to see another one? And she couldn't talk. <laughs> she just went like this, and I put another sheet in there, another perfect thing. And we, we then would drop on our knees. And we thank the Lord for the glorious experience that in these thousand times of history, of, uh, of Earth's history, we are being honored in this manner. What a marvelous thing. And uh, little, uh, uh, little Michael uh, came from school uh, at 4.30 or something like that, and uh, we showed him how beautiful it was <laughs> to have the Holy Spirit make toner. And then Mike and Linda came home at 5.30 after work, and then we showed them the same thing. And the copies came coming right along. How long did that last? 741 days, over two years. But now, I just, I just about done. Uh, what happened here is this. When the three weeks were almost over, I said to my mind, in myself, I don't want to go out and buy another cartridge. I want the Holy Spirit to keep working for, <laughs> for the benefit of others, you see? I said, why should I be the only one to enjoy something so, so beautiful? I said, Lord, I got something to talk to you about. And that was again in the middle of the night. I, like, I wake up in the middle of the night and then I go back to sleep, so I pray for people. Or I talk to the Lord about things that uh, I like to talk to him about. I said, Lord, you know, I get so many letters from your people. And the ones that are the most discouraging and disheartening and depressing is the one where they say that they're afraid of the time of trouble. For instance, one lady wrote to me and she said, you know, why is it that all seven Adventist ministers, when they go visiting somewhere, have got to talk on the, on the time of trouble? Can you explain that to me? You know, she says, every time that we have a visiting minister in our church, all he talks is about is a time of trouble and how terrible it's going to be. And we're going to be left alone and Christ's going to be out of the sanctuary. And my 18-year-old daughter is going to have a nervous breakdown over this thing. Well, every time that I hear there's a visiting minister at church, now I don't take her there. We go to another church, you see. And that's the way people feel about it. So I said, Lord, you know, it'd be so nice if you would, in your graciousness and in your tenderheartedness and compassion, uh, surprise your people and cause this, this toner to keep, uh, for the Holy Spirit to keep making toner, you see? By then, by the way, I find out after a while that the Spirit of God had not filled the toner uh, carpet. It was being made every time it was needed. Isn't that beautiful? Uh -huh. Yeah. Amen. So, uh, uh, and I said, Lord, if the machine was to go three months or four months without toner, and I could tell everybody what the Holy Spirit is doing and the reason why. Because you want to encourage us not to worry about the time of trouble. Because the Holy Spirit is going to be with we'll us. supply our needs. You see? Amen. <laughs> Boy, I said, I, I'm looking forward to those days, Lord, when I pulled at the service station and I, I say, fill her up. And the guy says, where is your number, your new number, you know, your card? I don't have one. Oh, you don't have one. I can't fill up your gas. Can't buy or sell. Uh, that's right. So I just come there and says, Lord, fill her up. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then we get back in the car and I say to the guy, I'll see you in six months, buddy, when I come back to see if you can sell me more gas. That's, that's right. <laughs> so, you know, I thought this way and, and, and the, Lord, the Lord honored me. And, and this, this copy. And people would come to our home, and the only thing they wanted, they wanted to do was to see God's miracle copier. People came over to watch your copy machine. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to tell you something interesting. A little thing. One day, I'm standing by the copier, and I'm making about a dozen copies. And the thought entered my mind, and I entertained that for maybe 15 seconds. How long is this thing going to go? before the Lord stops, uh, the Spirit of God stops making toner. Uh-oh. The next sheet came out, and guess what? Didn't look good. Blank. <laughs> White. <laughs> I just dropped on my knees and said, Lord, forgive me for offending you. I'm offending you. There I am, and turning in thoughts that, well, it, the Lord is not going to be forever blessing me, you know, in this manner. Uh, he's bound to come to, uh, to a stop. I said, I'm sorry, Lord. And Jesus says, be it unto you according to your faith. And right. when your faith yeah. altered a little bit, yeah. that's when the yes. white copy came out. Yeah. Now, the next one, I got up on my knees and I put a copy in there and it came out just beautiful. And it kept on going. And two years went by and it kept on making more copies. And one day I was uh, uh, duplicating a manuscript. 
And after making about 120 copies, and the machine was hot, and I never thought of turning it turning down. You know, it's one of those little ones that you personal you copier, yeah. one one sheet at a time. All of a sudden, the smoke starts pouring out of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> the circuit board, one of the circuit boards, had caught a fire. <laughs> so I plugged it, pulled the thing off the wall, and uh, anyway, the, the, the repair people said, "Now you can't repair it." So I have it now as a monumental pillar. Remind us of what the Lord has done to comfort us and to save us from the hand of the destroyer. All right, so. uh, let me quote this. For, uh, I, I love this. Let me. Uh, Ellen White says in Steps to Christ, let us keep uh, in our memory all the tender mercies that God has shown us. The tears is wiped away, the pains he has suited, the anxiety is removed, the fears dispelled, the want supply, the blessings bestowed. Thus strengthening ourselves for all that is before us, through the remainder of our pilgrimage. Amen. She wants us to think back upon these things. That's right. So if you ever want to see my old copiers under my bed, you're going to have to help <laughs> me leave the bed see it. Well, I'm especially <laughs> interested in that story because you can ask Karen, our copier stopped working yesterday. Oh, really? So uh, <laughs> maybe we'll have a story to tell you in a couple of years. You know, this next question, I think, is probably one of the most important. And uh, a lot of people who send you prayers they're not praying for themselves or for a personal problem, but a lot of people, their hearts are breaking and yearning over friends and loved ones, children in particular, mm -hmm. who are lost. Yep. And you pray for them. Um, and a lot of folks have reported miracles as a result of your prayer. Definitely. But uh, I think a lot of us recognize that um, maybe we're doing something wrong. What can we do uh, to pray for our loved ones Mm. that are lost and wandering. Is there a formula that you go through or how do you claim God's promises? Well, first of all, I tell the Lord, I don't know these people to begin with. Is their mother or father is writing to mm -hmm. me telling me about, you know, we've educated our, our sons and daughters in our schools and they're all out of the truth. What disheartening thing it is, you know. We don't even want to go to church because it's such a disgrace and we feel that we don't have our children with us and all of that. Mm. And I write them up and I write them and say, stop bashing yourself. You're not at fault. In reality, the nature that we have, the seeds of wickedness of ages past are flowing in our, in our veins, all of us, mm -hmm. including our children. And if we're placed in the right situation, wickedness will flourish into a, a, something that will baffle your imagination how wicked the person can be. And uh, now, I believe, this is my, my personal conviction, that some people are going to be saved strictly through the faith of others. Mm -hmm. I know it's in the testimonies where Ellen White wrote to this person and says, look, if you don't have the faith that you need to accept the promises of God and take him at his word, trust in the faith of others who are praying for you. Amen. And I researched this thing, and I've, I've come to the conclusion that as long as we pray for the atoning blood of Christ to be appropriated to these people every day, whether they know it or not, or whether they want it or not, we are uh, actually asking for the Holy Spirit to surround these people with a glorious heavenly atmosphere of light and peace. Now, there's some strange things happening to people and you can't understand what it is. You see, you left the church for so many years and they haven't prayed and etc. And one lady, she's 80 years old and she says, you know, the Lord is keeping me alive so, so that I can see my kids come back to church to love the Lord again. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, they were all professionals. And I said, I wrote her a letter, told her how we're going to pray for, for her children. And she write me three months later and she says, it's not a Things change, nothing. And, other, and I said, keep me, keep me posted. Keep, again, keep right on praying. Glorious intercessions are being made in the behalf of your loved ones. I would write her, you know. And another five, six months go by, and she write me again, no changes. And all of a sudden, she finds out that her oldest son and his wife are back in church now, visiting. Oh, just visiting. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't take too long that one of the daughters thought it'd be nice to go visiting also. Well, that's two years since then, okay? Mm -hmm. But now they're all back into the church. Amen. See? Now she says, I can die in peace. 
See, <laughs> unless the Lord comes back tomorrow. That's right. I said, lady, the Lord is, is good. You're in good hands. He's going to take care of you and of your kids. And uh, I believe earnestly and sincerely, as long as there's breath in the being, man, we have a duty as Christians to agonize before God for these people mm -hmm. to be made to walk in the earth made new. How do we have a stronger relationship with Jesus? If, if there was a handful of things that you might recommend, we've already touched on this a little bit, yeah. uh, personal devotions, and uh, you've talked about the importance of focusing on the cross, mm -hmm. but is there something else? Okay. I'm coming back to the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Okay. The last three elements that make up the fruit of the Holy Spirit is a living faith, uh, meekness and temperance, the Bible says. Temperance in reality is self-control. Mm -hmm. That's what it says in the original. Now, the living fight uh, is what we need, I think, most. You've got to have that living faith. You've got to agonize for the Lord to give you a living faith, a faith that will bring you an increase of spiritual strength. We need spiritual strength. And that will sustain us with an unfaltering trust in our Heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. and also in the power of His Holy Spirit. So when we believe this and receive this divine grace that will make us feel that way, we've reached a level of capacity that moves the end of the Almighty. And uh, the love of Christ will, will just burst in your heart. And then divine meekness is needed and self-control, the ability to check and regulate, to restrain and to govern self in all aspects of life, is what we need by the Holy Spirit operating in Amen. us. Now, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here back to rumor control. Okay. Um, when you pray, do you speak in tongues? <laughs> no, no. Not even Never. French. <laughs> no, that's right. I sometimes pray in French, yes. <laughs> but I understand what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> um, there seems to be, and again I'm paraphrasing here, there seems to be an increased interest in angels in the world today in the supernatural. And uh, we believe the devil is paving the way for a major deception, uh, you, you were told some things when you were involved in uh, spiritualism where because they thought that you were in for life, they revealed certain parts of the plans yeah. about how to deceive the world and how to corrupt even God's commandment keeping people and pave the way for the world, even the church, to accept fallen angels who are impersonating spirits of the dead. Is that happening now and what was it that you learned back then? It is happening now, and uh, it's happening in big ways. And the uh, idea of uh, the angels, see, as is, there's a drive right now to um, make people interested in angels. Doesn't care what kind of an angel. You see, see the newsstands, uh, the checkout counters, there's all kinds of stuff. Stuff, magazines, TV magazines programs, about, everything. Uh, experience with, with angels. And uh, I've been given a couple of books that were given to me. And, uh, and what do you think of this? And I'll tell you what, I don't read more than a dozen page that I find where there is a super deception being slowly, gradually, imperceptibly brought into, into the lives of, of people. And they think as the old devil would want them to think, feel as they feel, and then you see them act the way that, that you know, the devil wants them to act. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we have several questions here, and uh, if incidentally, Roger's just touching on some of these things, the books are available out there in the, in the hall or out in the uh, youth room later, and uh, you'll find more <laughs> detail. Uh, in, in summary, that book on angels, there was a group of very sincere Seventh-day Adventist people that step by step began to get involved in spiritism until they were listening to devils to the point where they committed murder. And they're in jail now, two of them are. And uh, that sort of thing, I think, is going to be more common as time progresses. 
Uh, we've already seen what happens with the uh, leaders like Jim Jones and David Koresh and others who tell people step by step. You know, they all started out reading the Bible. Yep. Jim Jones started out reading the Bible, and when they went down to Guyana, we baptized a girl who escaped just before they all committed suicide. The Bible was in the outhouse, and I won't tell you what they used it for. But they started out reading the Bible, and little by little, they get away. And that still happens wow. today. What can we do for our young people that are getting uh, entwined with rock music? And maybe you could elaborate on some of the yeah. dangers there. Yeah, rock music is a very powerful snare that demon spirits are using uh, to captivate the young people and draw them away from uh, Christ and his protection. And uh, in A Trip into the Supernatural, I mean in the uh, angel book, I talk about a couple that visited us in 19, remember Australia? 1991, that is correct. Uh, in the book, uh, in the angel book. Right. I have in there an experience that is very interesting due to the fact that the people who experience the rock music ensnarement were in our home uh, in the fall of 1991 and were seeking very special help. They came all the way from uh, across the world. Uh, the parents are super wealthy. And uh, what happened here is that this man married this fine young lady. And uh, it wasn't too long after that that he started to have some real problems. And uh, here's what happened. He went on their honeymoon and entering a big city he saw all of these billboards and signs talking about this, this uh, artist, rock artist, and his gang that was going to be there playing. Mm -hmm. And the bride said to the husband, oh, will, will you buy me tickets? We'll go and see it. And he had just decided in his heart that he was not going to go to these concerts anymore. You see? He had decided that. But then he got this tremendous feeling that, man, this is our honeymoon. This is, you know, I've got to do something for my bride that's going to really please her. And he gave in and went to the rock concert. And while they were in the rock concert, uh, like the high priest used to say, when a person in, enters an establishment that is dedicated to the service of the great master, meaning Satan, yeah, such as astrologers, fortune tellers, different capacities, hypnotists, mm -hmm. and people like that, the angels of the Lord are not able to come in there. But he did say at one time that the spirit of the Creator could. There was no limit to the spirit of the Creator. See? But the angels of our rival, Christ, cannot enter there because of the fact that these rock artists usually uh, dedicate the building or the, the area that's going to be covered by uh, the listeners. Mm -hmm. They circle it three times in one day or three times, the three consecutive days. And they, they, chant, they, they sang a mitra, which is a, a, a prayer for possession. And they actually prayed to the great master and his angels that they will captivate every young person that enters that area and control them in their lives, etc., etc. So what happened is this. They, they come out of this place and the next day they're, they're driving down the road and she sees the word green. Oh, no, oh, no, excuse me. Harley Davidson motorcycle. She, they were following a Harley Davidson motorcycle and the guy had, you know, on the back of an, I mean, a big sign, Harley Davidson on, on his jacket and things like that. And she started to, to cry cry for no reason at all. And, 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 the, and her husband says, what's the matter with you? Are you hurting somewhere? No, but for some reason I keep just crying. He said, look, stop this nonsense. So uh, they go down the, 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 the road and they see a sign and on it says green, we'll say a green label, tomatoes. You see. And she starts crying again, just an hour later, for no reason at all. 
Why? And do you know that uh, uh, she started to go into uh, almost trance in difficult situations that, that were unbelievable. And uh, the, the father phoned me up from, from uh, across the world and said, our son-in-law and our daughter wants to go to Endicott, New York to see you so you can pray for her. And she believes that she'll be anointed that the whatever is, is taking place. The Some doctors, type of possession she was wrestling with. Yeah. We noticed when she was visiting us that she had something in her ear, in a little wire about uh, behind her ear and then into her hair, and it was into her handbag, something in her handbag. She had a little player that was playing rock music. And he one morning came in to see us because he said, my wife can't come because she's been crying all night. Uh, but he said, uh, we, we hope that the ministry will agree to anoint her, you know, etc. And I asked him, I said, let me ask you, is your wife listening to rock music on her little Walkman? Uh, her little radio? Uh, it was a cassette player, right. tiny little one. He said, I'd hope that you wouldn't ask me that question. He said, yes. And I explained to him, I said, powerful spirits have found an avenue to control your minds, I mean your wife's emotions. See? Here's the way it goes. The high priest said that the demon spirits love to play games with Christians. First of all, they love to move upon people's imagination and to create strong feelings of anger, fear, love, and uh, grief. They, make, they can create all these feelings to people, and people believe it's their own, uh, you know, it's their own being, it feels this way. Mm -hmm. And then from there on, I told him how we we're going to pray for his wife. Went back, or he, he was, she was anointed, and they went back home, and things were not any better. Things were worse. Until one day, Daddy phoned me up and he said, Roger, uh, my wife has had a terrible experience yesterday. She is, she doesn't have any broken bones, oh, but how, boy, did the spirits ever, ever do her in. Almost kill her. He said, I was in, in, in the kitchen and I heard go down the hallway to the bathroom. Then I heard this, you were yelling and screaming and help, help, help. Some invisible being grabbed her by the hair from the back, brought her in, in, in the bathroom, and there was a tile floor, threw her on her face, and bashed her head until blood was flowing all over from her nose. Her eyes were cut above her eyes. Um, and he came, and he said, he, and he, he said, Dear Jesus, please help. Because I told him that. If that something ever happened, and you have the, the, you know that it's the presence of demon spirits, you immediately say, "Dear Jesus, please help." Mm -hmm. Immediately, the the force gave up, and he says it's just like a strong man had her uh, one by one shoulder, in her hand, yeah. bashing her head, and he brought her up and cleaned her up and all of that, and uh, he said, "What uh, should we do?" I said, "What you're going to have to do." He's going to have, you're going to have to have your, stop. I said, the idea of you and I and everybody else praying for her mm -hmm. is marvelous. You know, we should do it. We shouldn't stop. But you've got to have her pray for help herself. Well, he says, she can't pray for help. Because as soon as she starts praying, her jaws lock up. You see? And as soon as she says Jesus, it's like uh, pushing needles into her ears. You see? And uh, so anyway, I said, you take her like she was a two-year-old and have her repeat every word after you. Mm -hmm. And do you know that she couldn't open her mouth, but she could say, Dear Jesus, mm -hmm. please help, you know? And she started to pray. She said, you got to pray for herself. She got to pray for divine grace. And you, you, you instruct her. You, you have her pray along with you. And that broke the bond of bondage and that she was free. She have a beautiful child, and they got a letter a few months back, uh, you know, and they're happy. Amen. Well, I've seen that happen many times. Um, 
in the book Beware of Angels, we've touched on, mm -hmm. um, you use the real names. Yeah. And of course, uh, this is all documented, and I think you wanted to uh, authenticate that this is not a story that's been fabricated, even though it seems unbelievable. Yeah. But is that the reason you use the real names in that well, book? I had, I had to, see, because of the fact that nobody would have, no one would have believed me. And I knew that it was going to hurt some of the people uh, that had been affiliated in this group of uh, 29 people to begin with, and it came down to 20 and 15. And that's why it, it, it led, that was in a period of five years. Because as soon as the angels started to have them go to stores and rob, you know, mm -hmm. objects, television sets and everything else, and they made the objects to be invisible. Uh, that's when a lot of them got shook up, some of the others got shook up and left the group. Because the, the uh, angel appeared and says, you got to prepare for the time of trouble. And God has designated you people here in Oregon to prepare to help the Californians that are going to come up here as soon as San Francisco goes down the, into the deeps, into the ocean, and some of the other uh, cities are destroyed. Mm -hmm. You're going to head here for the mountains of Oregon for the time of trouble. And you have to be prepared for them. So the angel said, God wants you to know this. He owns the earth and everything in it. Now, so he used that to have them steal. Yeah. Now we're going to tell you, God wants you to go into certain stores and take objects that belongs to him because these people that own these stores are total. In other words, they're totally controlled by demons. You see? And they're lost. So God wants his merchandise that they have for you to take it, sell it, keep the money for the time of trouble, and also store some of the st stuff in a big barn. They had a big barn that some old Venice man owned. And they started to, to store this stuff. In six months, they, they stole over $56,000 of the merchandise. And you know, the one thing that, that was interesting that got my attention in a special way is that one day the angel says, now that you know how to do this work for the Lord, uh, we are going to uh, help you make money. So he says, you're going to go down to this, this major store mm -hmm. and you are going to uh, walk out with a... a 27-inch television, television set. There were four of them. Now, the uh, people that will not see the television set. They just see you walk out of there. Then you're going to go back again five times, five, four more times. But every time you're going to enter there, we're going to make not only your clothing to be different color and different style, but also your, your facial expressions. You will not be the same person that they saw an hour ago. So if the camera shines on you, don't worry. They won't about. recognize you. They won't recognize. They won't recognize you. And they did that. And after that, they were they, they, they were hooked for good. No way. And the sisters told me that. I looked at them face to face. I went up to to Oregon to interview these people in that uh, women's prison for one reason. And I told the Lord, I cannot write a book unless you make it possible for me to go to Oregon with my bad heart and all. That you're going to have to give me some some of that Elijah strength I talked to you about mm -hmm. the other day. <laughs> and get me up there and back. And also, I want to be able to ask them hard questions and look them right in the eyes. And I want your spirit to be with me so that they give me the exact, they tell me the truth and tell me the, exactly what I'm looking for. And I got everything I wanted. Even though the prison, the prison people changed their mind. I was going to be going in there with a, with a clipboard, if I wanted to, and pencil, and then, uh, you know, one of these little recorders. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, three or four days before it happened, we were up there. Somebody canceled this thing out. You can't be here. We're not, so they canceled all, all my good rights that they had given me. And I had to go in there, uh, well, with no, not even a sheet of paper I couldn't bring in. But the Lord uh, helped uh, Hildar and I. As soon as we'd get in the car, we'd start like, writing like everything, you know, taking notes of what we did. it. So it was quite an experience. And uh, what happened after that, after they had been hooked good, on stealing five times on the same day. Then the angel, uh, a little while later, said, God has got a special job for you. There are six individuals that he wants you to destroy. They didn't say killing, destroy. And they should, be, they should be shot with a 38 caliber and always use two bullets to each person. And there was a reason for that too. Now these are supposedly <laughs> angels of God oh, yeah. mm -hmm. giving these uh, ladies this information. <laughs> And you know, these, these uh, ladies were t talking to these angels and, and the angel uh, seemed to be a little depressed one day. 
And they said, why are you my uh, messenger angel look so disheartened? Mm -hmm. He said, my, they were two angels, they were given two angels. Uh, my friend and I, we just love on the Sabbath to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to him talk to us in heaven. And we haven't been there in a long time. So they, they give them the right, okay, we give you the right to go to heaven in, in the, tomorrow on the coming Sabbath. And we enjoy yourself with the Lord and bring us some good news. And the, the angel would come back you know, and give them all kinds of glorious stories, man. So they killed two people out of six, as you're going to read in the book. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to close with a question that I think is uh, on the hearts of some. Somebody wrote in, what would you say to those who are anxious that God is not able, will not be able to work in their lives after you're gone and not able to pray for them? I guess some people are hinging mm -hmm. a lot of their faith on your intercession. Yes. And how would you respond to that? I'll tell you what. I made provision for that. That if I die, nothing is going to change. As a matter of fact, things get, may even get better. I'll tell you why. <laughs> I talked to the Lord Jesus in prayer. said, Lord, uh, it could very well be that one of these days I'm going to go to sleep. And who's going to be interceding in my behalf? I see no one other than you, Lord, to be able to do this. Now, you see, I should go back first to Gen in, uh, Exodus 28, 29. When the tabernacle was being erected in the uh, wilderness, Moses was told by the Lord that Aaron shall bear the names of all the children of Israel upon his heart uh, in the... In the uh, the breastplate, breastplate of, of mm -hmm. judgment upon his heart uh, when he goeth in into the holy place mm -hmm. as a memorial before the Lord continually. Right. So Ellen White says in Steps to Christ that is a figure of what Christ is doing for us in the holy of holies of the heavenly sanctuary. And she explains in her writings the fact that one of the greatest honors and most wonderful things we could do for any person is to ask the Lord Jesus to write their names, engrave their names upon the breastplate of his priestly garment. So when anybody gives me a name to be prayed for, okay, Hilda and I, we kneel, we open the Bible at the 27th chapter of Matthew, we put these requests there, and every one of these individuals is prayed for that the Lord Jesus, in his love, will engrave their name upon the breastplate of his priestly garment. Now, this past week, uh, you know, people said, well, how could the, the Lord <laughs> engrave, you know, there wouldn't be enough place, you know, in a, enough place for uh, uh, but his name. But I found out last week that the whole Bible has been put on a little chip, one inch square. Isn't that amazing? That's right. It's microscopic printing that he has. Yeah, I've actually seen a copy of the Bible on microfilm that mm -hmm. is, as you just said, just a, a, a microscopic square. thing. But now with computers, they're able to put all the information of the Bible yeah. on even less space than yeah. that on tape. So when the Lord was saying uh, uh, that uh, Aaron was going to carry the names of the children of Israel up in the breastplate, on the breastplate of judgment upon his heart continually, he was not exaggerating. That's he no was problem for stating God. Stating a fact. Mm -hmm. That's right. So every one of my prayer subjects has been brought before the Lord and I've asked the Lord to engrave their name upon the breastplate of his priestly garment. Amen. And I would like to suggest that part of good leadership is discipling and some of the young people that you've worked with, we, mm -hmm. we hope that they will pick up the mantle right. and continue because uh, yeah. especially in these last days before the sanctuary mm -hmm. closes, I think it's very important for us to learn how to intercede for mm -hmm. others and uh, for our own souls, salvation. Yeah. Anything that uh, you've left out that's on your heart that the Holy Spirit's impressing you with? Ellen White, you know, finished the, the book, The Greek Controversy, and uh, being led by the Spirit of God, she was told many beautiful things that the redeemed of the Lord are going to experience in heaven. And one of the things that she said, their immortal minds will contemplate with never-failing delight the wonders of creative power, the mysteries of redeeming love. There will be no cruel, deceiving foe to attempt to forgetfulness of God. Mm -hmm. The acquirement of knowledge will not weary the mind or exhaust the energies. There 
the greatest enterprises may be carried forward, the loftiest aspirations reached, the highest ambitions realized. And still, there will arise new heights to, sur to surmount, new wonders to admire, new truths to comprehend, and fresh objects to call for the power of mind and body. The uh, universe will be open to the study of God's redeemed. With unutterable delight, the children of earth enter into the joy and the wisdom of unfallen beings. They share the knowledge of and understanding gained through ages upon ages in the contemplation of God's handiwork. With undimmed vision, they gaze upon the glory of creation, suns and stars and systems, all in their appointed order, circling the throne of deity. And the years of eternity as they roll will bring richer and still more glorious revelations of God and of Christ. The more men learn, learn about God, the greater will be their admiration of his character. And as Jesus opens before them uh, the riches of redemption and the mighty achievements in the great controversy with Satan, the hearts of the ransom thrill with more fervent devotion. And with more rapturous joy, they sweep the harps of gold. And 10,000 times, 10,000 and thousands of voices unite into a mighty chorus of praise. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats throughout the vast creation. From him who created all, flows light and life and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare that God is love. Amen. Well, I think that's a very powerful place for us to uh, come before the Lord. And it, I'd like to invite our group tonight, if you join us in kneeling together, if we have any cards that we'd like to bring up. And Roger, we'd like to ask you to lead us before God's throne. And uh, in the words of the apostles, teach us to pray uh, by example. Could we kneel together? Our Father in heaven, thou a great monarch of the galaxies, ancient of days. We come to thee to thank thee, Father, first for thine infinite heart of love mm -hmm. and for the Lord Jesus, for having come to this land of the enemy, have gone the way of Calvary and purchased our redemption at such a great cost. And Father, our hearts thrill at the thought that your Holy Spirit is ever present uh, to, to bless our lives and the lives of those that we pray for. As we live in this land of the enemy, we need to be encouraged, upheld, given a bright vision of good things to come. And this can be done only by the Holy Spirit blessing our minds in very special ways. Okay. We ask at this time, Father, for thy very special blessing to rest upon everyone here present. Uh, we look upon these uh, questions here that people have brought forth that they would like to, 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 to hear answers from. Uh, may thine Holy Spirit, Lord, uh, bring these answers to their, to their lives. And if I have addresses there, I will write back to people and give them uh, an, an insight of things that I have experienced by your love and your grace. Dear Father, be with us now and uh, teach us like the Lord Jesus would have us. Be like him in character and to live for him now that we may live with him mm -hmm. throughout the eternal ages. In his holy name we pray, Father, to the glory of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.